morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids and cubs. And we have a very special episode for you today. The Beaver Lodge, when it has a guest, asks their guests if they're willing to provide an extended interview so that we may better get to know them and what makes them tick. And then when they agree, well, we package it together and present it to you as part of this series. So welcome to Season 4 and Episode number 57 of the True North Eager Beaver Interview Project, a series of extended chats with interesting Canadians who have things to say about which you should be aware. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Today, recording day is Thursday, September 26, 2024, and this morning's rain has given way to some sunshine, which is absolutely wonderful. And I cannot tell you what day it is that we're going to broadcast this because we still don't know. (laughs) But it'll it'll be coming out. Don't worry. Um, Well, it's coming out. You know it's out because you're watching it now. (laughs) A big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health this afternoon? You know, uh, I think I'd like to say that it's it's pretty good, pretty good. Uh, feeling good physically. I got a nap in earlier, which I desperately needed because I did not sleep well last night. And I went out for a nice long walk with Lola, so that was great. Had some sunshine. Mm-hmm. Uh, got a few more chapters recorded on one of the books I'm narrating. So yeah, I'd say today's been a good day. Didn't get as much done as I wanted to, but I got a hundred percent more done than I did yesterday. So there you go. That's how you got to view it, right? Right, right. That's progress. Exactly. 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 Mm -hmm. Uh, I am especially happy that you, dearest kids and cubs, have joined Mr. Grizzly and I this morning for this particular episode because I'm kind of excited about this. Um, Our guest, uh, we had a a bit of an interesting meeting. We had the the show just the other day uh, when we discussed, among other things, Danielle, Premier Danielle Smith's desire to um, beef up the Bill of Rights, <clears throat> to put it kindly. And um, this fine person uh, sent us a little message that, um, well, you'll see why it spoke to my heart. Okay. Said, if ever you need to fill a guest slot with a foul mouthed Canadian economist, I may know a guy. <laughs> You had me at foul-mouthed economist. <laughs> I go, like, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Turns out we happen to be particularly fond of foul-mouthed yes. Canadian economists. And we actually did have our eye on one for such a guest spot. Perhaps we're tweeting about the same guy. So, <laughs> and, and it is true. I, I had been following his account and thinking, I should send him an invitation. But he offered first. So wow. that worked and, out well. 
It did. It did. So I said, no time like the present. So here we are. Kits and Cubs. Our guest today is from St. Albert and is an energy economist specializing in electrical utilities. Which he province had, is St. Albert in? Um, it, it's common. Okay. Because <laughs> you just said St. Albert. I know. I know. There's lots of them in Canada. Yes. He had worked for clients across the U.S. and Canada, including many Ontario customers. He was the former head of the Utilities Consumer Advocate Office in Alberta, a job he quit in July 2009, a former Wild Rose board member, and now the chair of Alberta Resistance, which is a nonpartisan grassroots movement seeking to hold our elected officials accountable. And if you want to check that out, that's at AB underscore resistance. And he is a guitarist for the far northern band Pressure Ridge. He's a self-described pragmatist. I get the sense that, like me, he might be a bit of an impatient optimist. <laughs> His Twitter feed says, if you have a current net worth below $25 million, we should be friends. So we're going yeah, to be right. friends. Yeah. <laughs> like most economists these days, he swears a lot. <laughs> Get some cubs. Please put your paws up and give a big round of a pause for Mr. Dave Gray. Welcome to the Beaver Lodge. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to have you. Um I was I wasn't sure if um you know Red Green was gonna make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your stick on the ice, eh? That's possum lodge. That's possum. Uh, so close. Yes. Um <laughs> Uh, I, I always secret weapon and duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> I always ask Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing before we start a show, and we also ask it for our guests. So, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Uh, it's doing quite well, um, considering all the stuff that's going on. Uh, but uh, you know, the sun has come up. I am uh, still getting to enjoy it, and uh, we'll put everything else in perspective from there. Mm. Nice. Now, it's, been a big media day for you because you've been doing some stuff with global this morning i have the misfortune of being uh bilingual in both english and jargon <laughs> <laughs> i also do a bit of french but that's uh, beside the point <laughs> the um or the petit pou if you're monsieur uh, Boleyev. but the yeah the thing i was talking about today was the changes they're making to the retail rates here in alberta um, they're boxed themselves into a corner that about a third of people can't actually get a competitive retail, uh, program mm -hmm. because they don't qualify for credit. When you buy electricity and sign up for a multi-year contract, uh, you're essentially buying a car, right? It's a mm -hmm. few thousand dollars worth of mm -hmm. stuff you're buying. And so credit is very important to those companies and about a third of Albertans don't qualify. Really? So they're um, mucking around with what was called the regulated rate and will now be called the rate of last resort to make it sound bad. Well, at the same time as they stabilize it and make it more attractive. So it's, it's a, f in 30 years of economics, politics wins every time. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of where we're at with Alberta electricity. Mm, interesting. Uh, I'd like to get into well, that a little. Al Alberta is just under 5 million people and a third of the population have no credit. Right. Wow. That is yeah. staggering. Mm, yeah. Well, it's the way it is. And that's four point. Probably about the same in Ontario. Million. Oh, is it really? I did, see, I didn't know that. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. 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 Um, not my area of expertise, obviously. <laughs> well, well, we, have... we, can, we can get into uh, income inequality and, and wealth inequality if you want, because if, Happy to. if you wanted to pick one thing that was the biggest problem in our world right now, that's probably it. Um, five guys have all the money. Yes. Mm, indeed. Now, I'd like to, I want to sort of put a pin in that because I, I want the kids to sort of know. Uh, the overall temperature of the water that we're bathing here, that they, that these comments uh, are, are going to come. So on your Twitter feed, it also says there's a Latin phrase there. And now my Latin is not the best, but I do know enough about Latin to know that if someone puts a Latin phrase up front on a social media bio, that it's something that means something to them. And yours is 
Ah, I lost it. Verum in Imperio. Truth in government. I want to know what motivated that. When you look at the world, the biggest change in the last five years has been the number of people who have splintered off into their own reality, right? Mm. The number of people where the sources where they get information from are impeached. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whether they're Russian or Chinese or Turkish, or, uh, we have an awful lot of what in wartime would be enemy propaganda mm-hmm. making up the bulk of our political discourse. And the concern that I have is that we've got um, political parties who are knowingly taking that impeached information and uh, going to town with it and running with it. Um, it's just the most insane thing I've ever seen. Um, and it, it all seems to be happening on one side where the low information voters aggregate. Well, and, and this is the reason we have a show. Yeah. Right. Because we just got, you know, we were both, I mean, Mr. Beaver had the blog for a number of years, but and he's like, would you be interested in the podcast? I said, yes. And then we'll move on to YouTube eventually, which, you know, it took a little bit of work to get him there, but he's there and he's happy with it now. Right. But it was like, because, so much misinformation, disinformation, outright lies mm-hmm. are spread across well the world. But you know, I, I blame a lot. I blame a lot of this on the previous conservative government by selling out to you know uh, Chatham Asset Management, which is uh, Post Media, which owns sixty percent of mm-hmm. the news media in this company in this country. And as a result, we get heavily skewed. Uh, right-wing talking points on a daily basis from a group of people who do not have Canadians best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. They have right-wing evangelical Christian GOP talking points. And it's not happening if everybody gets in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh boy. (laughs) I mean, and and I blame, I blame the Harper government because they're the ones who allowed that ownership stake because you could not own a media company in this country if you were not Canadian at one point in time. And then they changed the rules. So it's, it was supposed to be 50%, but Chatham asset management has 60% of post media. Harper's church was right down the street from where I grew up in Calgary. So, Mm. um, I was halfway between the first Alliance church and, uh, the Southern's mansion overlooking Glenmore reservoir. Um, and it's beautiful sunsets. I give him credit for doggedly pursuing a extreme right-wing evangelical agenda in a remarkable stealth. Oh yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But there's the, they can't hide it anymore. It's obvious that the end game for a lot of this is to return to some form of vassalhood Mm -hmm. for those who are undeserving and um, some sort of sainthood for those who are, (laughs) right? I don't think I've ever heard it put better, though, what you just said. They did it so stealthily. Marcy McDonald wrote a great book about it. (laughs) It was largely ignored. And I, Mm. I bought the book recently and I've been reading through it and it's like, more people need to know about this because like you say, it was stealth the way they did it. It was mm-hmm. I got to, I got to salute him for how well of a job it was. And as Mr. Beaver would say, he was the king of incrementalism, right? He never yeah. did anything in broad strokes. It was always just chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. Yeah. Until eventually you get, um, you know, a very strange statue of Jesus with a sword. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they want Gilead. They want Gilead. They do. They want everyone to, um, obey their laws, the laws mm-hmm. that they feel have been handed down from above. Um, and uh, faith doesn't have much place in law. No. Um, and it shouldn't, because it's it based on what is truthful and knowable. Um, and yeah, if, if faith enters into the equation, you tend to have a problem politically, because such people never compromise. Mm-hmm. Right? Right, right. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, please go on. No, well, I was just going to see if we could talk about something cheerier, like, you know, yes. 401, because that sounds like a great idea. 
<laughs> <laughs> yes. The other question I wanted to know is how do you go from Wild Rose board member to having uh, been the advocate to leaving because, you know, obviously, and we can get into some issues there with regard to, because there's things that you predicted that would happen that have come true. Mm -hmm. Because, and people didn't like you saying them because everybody hates a Cassandra, I guess. Uh, but it seems that there's a bit of a journey there, <laughs> which interests, interests me on a human level. Uh, the reason that I joined up with Wild Rose was very much the same reason that I'm fighting the UCP now, even though the leader is the same between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, see, I knew Danielle Smith before she was um, any kind of leader. She was part of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. Um, I was the first... Um, call it utility knowledgeable person hired by the utilities consumer advocate. So I ended up um, basically running the joint. The, um, the thing with Danielle was that she wasn't always quite so um, staunchly right wing. And the first question I asked when she asked if I would help her with her campaign was, can I still believe in the antiquity of dinosaurs? So she said yes, and so I helped with the Wild Rose campaign because the conservatives at the time were doing just horrible, terrible things in electricity and utilities. And that's where I come from. I started off as the chief economist for a power company um, and was very concerned and have always been very concerned about the public interest. Mm -hmm. The public interest is a tangible, countable thing. And the conservative strategy over a couple of decades now has been to take that public interest, package it, and resell it wherever they can, right? Essentially, Harper balanced the budget by selling off everything that wasn't nailed down, yeah. right? And that's very much the idea that these people have now in politics, that government is something you need to drown in the bathtub, right? It's 1980s Reagan uh, yeah. on steroids. And th what they miss is that they're making us all worse off, even themselves. I mean, oh, the, yes. The rich people are the stupidest because they have the power to actually change the system or, you know, make sure that it's working for them, but they'd rather destroy it uh, than see someone else benefit. If I was going to name one vice that is the root cause of our problems. It's uh, envy and the desire to be special, right? People prefer it when what they have can't be had by someone else. Yes. And that's a very selfish uh, and zero sum place to go, mm. which is what ruins economies. Economies are magic. I mean, people don't understand that. Um, people think of economics as a very very much like accounting, mm -hmm. but it's not like accounting uh, because we involve magic. They say economists are accountants with a personality, and that's not true. We're accountants with a personality disorder. <laughs> well, wasn't Stephen Harper an economist? <laughs> uh, he was, and oddly enough, he was went to the same school as me, uh, mm -hmm. University of Calgary. Sorry, don't mind me. My uh, chair decided to get up. Um, and he was not a very good student. Clearly. That I got that the, feeling. That was the biggest problem. He was always over hanging out, uh, hanging out in uh, poli sci, right? We're trying to plot the route to power. Um, but yeah, in, in general terms, he's not a good economic student. He was not well liked. He didn't go into the heavy duty math classes. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 he has a lot of things wrong. Let's buy GM stock and then sell it at a loss. Yeah. Shade, shade. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm no rocket surgeon, but I know that you should hang on to it until it becomes worth something before you sell it. And here's the thing. As a nation, we could have hung on to that stock for a hundred years mm -hmm. and just watch it appreciate. Kind of like, oh, I'm just going to go with the sovereign fund they have in Norway, which is what worth how many trillions right now? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. 
I mean, that was supposed to be what happened with the Heritage Trust Fund in Alberta. That's where Norway got the idea. Yeah, I know. Um, the difference was they said, let's keep, let's keep putting into it and don't touch. They didn't even touch it during COVID. Like, no, no. It, it, Norwegians are wonderful and special people who have um, a great deal of homogeneity. Our biggest problem is, is that we're not a very good country. Um, we are antagonistic to each other more than we are helpful. Yeah, that's true. Um, and from Alberta's perspective, it's not ever going to get any better. And the reason is very simple, that uh, we have no political leverage, right? Because my fellow Albertans so resolutely only vote one way, mm -hmm. there's no more leverage. They're never going to get anything from a federal conservative government because they need votes in Ontario and Quebec. They yeah. don't need any more votes in Alberta. They've got them all. Yeah, so they don't care. They, they don't literally care. don't care. They, when uh, Harper and Kenny changed uh, the rules on income trusts for energy income trusts, cost my family $330,000 overnight, right? Um, That's a big <laughs> hit. We've done okay. <laughs> Look, Still. It, <laughs> yeah, it, it was just the antithesis of putting in an Alberta-friendly government. There right. was there, there was nothing genuinely conservative about that ideologically in purity. There was nothing conservative about that. No, no. I mean, I I go back to being a conservative with Mulroney. He was probably the mm -hmm. first guy that I ever got out and actively supported. And you know, at least then, uh, conservatives were on the side of economics, even if economics I, itself was struggling and trying to figure out what exactly what was going on in this complex adaptive system that we have um uh, at least they were on the side of economics right the, mm -hmm. the gst yeah. is a classic we're, we're going to take the manufacturer's sales tax and we're going to make it transparent and applicable to everything yeah. right that was smart economics yeah right? and we um, hated the gst and now we're looking at it now and saying that's actually a good tax yeah um, well, I remember at the time when he said, look, you don't like this right now. You probably hate me for it, but I guarantee you in, in the future, history will look at me and say, you did, you did a lot to help save Canada. And I'm like, I can't lie about that. I mean, there's a lot of things he did. I disagreed with selling off air Canada, I think was a, a dumb thing to do. That's mm -hmm. my personal opinion, because you look at how terrible the service with air Canada is these days. <laughs> It's there's a lot of that everywhere, isn't there? Well, look what happened to WestJet when Onyx bought them out. It's not yeah. it's not the same company, you know. Everything is made worse with venture capital. Yeah, it's true. It, it, it shitifies the world. It's true, um, and it will just get worse. And the reason is just math. I mean, it, it, money makes it easier to make money. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know to realize that the natural distribution of wealth is logarithmic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so just good. I'm testing the water here. I'm not sure how you guys do with math. So I'm just. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. I live with a, a math guy. Okay. All right. Well, I won't yeah. hold back then. <laughs> no, nope, please don't. I could always ask Alex for help. <laughs> now, yeah. So here we are in this funny situation where, um, you know, Alberta is just rife for disappointment in mm -hmm. every aspect of right. things. Everybody here wants to be a rich Texan. Yeah. Um, but they don't understand how many poor Texans there are. <laughs> right. And there's so but, many of them. Oh, it's, I, yeah, I, you know, I, that's the thing that always amazes me is that everybody that wants to, you know, throw their hat in the ring of American free market capitalism uh, assumes they're going to win. <laughs> like, like, let's just go down to the casino and uh, put some quarters in the slot machine and pull the old one arm bandit because it, it's the same thing. It's just on a larger scale, right? Uh, no, it's worse. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's worse because the odds get worse as you get poorer. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. at least in the casino, your odds don't change depending on your bankroll. Right. Right. You can this be on the true. last quarter and... Yeah, and, and strike a big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you're already, if you're already if you're... $2 million in the hole and you get another $250,000 bill, that's the end of you. 
Yeah, well, you know, it's very expensive being poor. Right? Yes. I say that all the time. Yeah. It is so expensive to be poor. Yeah. And I used to, you know, because I'm I've somebody who's struggled my whole life. Uh, I've never earned a lot of money. I've never made them. I was in the middle class for about, for about a year and a half, a bunch of years ago. And then that position changed. And now I'm back to working class. But I made a decision about three years ago. It was like, okay, I know I'm working class, but I'm going to budget so that I can spend money on quality items so I don't have to replace them every two years. Mm -hmm. And and that's the, the, that's the slap in the face of being poor. You can't afford the $300 boots that will last you 20 years. Right. So you buy the $35 boots that last you one year and you replace them 10 times in the next 10 years. Huh. You've just spent $350. Well, more than that, because the price would go up over the 10 year time period and you're still not ahead. Whereas if you bought the $300 boots to begin with, that will last you 20 years, you know, anyway. Yeah. It's well, expensive to be poor. It's, and it's also expensive to be rich. Um, mm. Cause mm we all may have something that they will never have, which is enough. Right. I just said that the other day too, on the show. I just said that the other day yeah. on the show. <laughs> it's mind meld. Yes. Indeed. It's, see, it's the, 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 the hair that's haircut. in the way of the efficient <laughs> transmission. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true. It's like, even though I, I'm like, I don't have any money coming in right now. I've got some, some contract work here and there, and I hope to have some revenue at some point in time. And I'm looking at cashing out my D DPSP from my former employee deferred profit sharing program, my oh. RSPs. I'm just going to roll into a different RSP and take care of that. But I, I think I can float for a little bit and generate some income. And I have a sales position that's been offered to me. So, you know, uh, my, 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 my outlook is good and I'm, I'm feeling very positive, but at the same token, it's like, I, I'm not going to just go back to taking the first thing that comes along because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just getting, I'm going back to where I was before and suffering again, right? Take the first thing that comes along, not earning nearly enough money. What I'm trying to say out of all of this I know I'm going, sometimes I go in a big circle and Mr. Beaver, Beaver can be like, where, where, where are you going with this? What I'm trying to say is, despite the fact that I don't have a full-time income, despite the fact that I only have little bits of money coming in here and there, I have enough. Huh? I have enough. I have more than enough. And that I can sleep at night with. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I'm not consumed by more, 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 more. Yes, a little bit more money would make life a little bit easier, and I could plan to actually retire someday if I chose choose to do so, which is doubtful because, you know. But the key thing is, I have enough. Mm -hmm. That's got to be the most difficult thing for those people to be so loaded mm -hmm. and yet unhappy. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing you compare yourself to are the people that you choose to associate with. So if you choose to associate with people that are rich, odds are they're richer than you. <laughs> right? It's, right. I, if you wanted to point at one thing, um, the super yacht contest, competition oh, yes, yes. amongst billionaires taking the combined output of billions of people and dedicating them to a toy for a toy. one person is um, the sort of thing that kept marks up at night, <laughs> right? Is how can we, on the one hand, harness the power of creativity and innovation that you get in a free market economy, mm -hmm with the fact that free market economies on their own won't keep everybody alive. No. I mean, they will quite happily let people starve uh, or live in agony rather than part with a dime. And at some point, that's a pathology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're collecting um, you know, newspapers or you're collecting currency, um, at some point, you're just a hoarder. Yes. Yes. The difference between uh, a remedy and the poison is the dose. Yeah. So let's talk about Doug Ford. Yes. Since we're talking <laughs> about poison. Um, <laughs> no. 
That was good. That was a good segue. Sorry. Sir. Sorry. We need to have you have back again. more often. <laughs> I'm enjoying um, this. Well, I'm always, I am always curious because I did have a number of clients uh, in Ontario uh, for electricity. I mean, my specialty is how to take your power bill as a an in, large industrial customer and make it smaller, right? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it was always fascinating to get the skinny on El our Ontario politics and particularly right. Ontario energy policy from those guys. Um, I sat in a conference beside the uh, maintenance manager for Ferrero Rocher, and they were just getting ready to install two jet turbine engines at their plant rather than having to pay for power from the grid. Yeah, because it was cheaper in the long run, right? Yeah, yeah, cheaper plus they get the heat, right? Yeah, yeah. They already needed the heat, so if you can kill two birds with a stone, uh, it makes sense. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. And it's those are usually the big Rolls Royce engines that you'd see on like a triple seven or something like that. I believe are they not? Yeah, yeah. There's big jet engines, quite efficient, you know. And they uh, they take the heat off the back end, and then they can use it in their process. So you end up getting like ninety percent thermal efficiency, which wow. is incredibly good. That's a, that's incredibly good. Yeah. Great. Um, now, you mentioned in our pre-show chat that you saw some similarity between something going on in Alberta and something going on in Ontario. Um, was it the focus on alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of them for sure. <laughs> um, I, I was in Calgary this summer. I was there for two weeks. I was there during the Stampede, staying at my buddy's place. And and one of the things I noticed, and, and some of the documentation I've read about it, it's like privatization for alcohol sales in Alberta caused prices to actually go up. And everywhere I went, if I went to a liquor store to buy beer, I noticed it was a dollar to a dollar fifty more per can on the same stuff I get at the LCBO here in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which I was, I was kind of surprised. I, I thought maybe, you know, 50 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents, that sort of thing, but a buck to a buck and a half, and in some cases, $2 more for the same product. I was shocked. Um, the smaller you make your business, the uh, bigger you have to make your profit margins in order to yep. survive, right? So, yeah, yeah I don't, uh, we certainly have, um, substantially more choice than we used to get with the Alberta Liquor Control Board stores. Um, trying to think of when was the last time I was actually in one. It might have been when I was 16 buying beer for my 17-year-old cousins. I had a mustache, so. <laughs> um, familiar with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, and in some ways, it was a success um and that mostly comes from the consumer side aspect of more choice more variety better hours of operation um but yeah that it, it, it's not the most efficient way to distribute alcohol to the masses um and i'm sure that you're finding in the 7-elevens that your prices are relatively high there as well uh, actually no? I'm not going to lie. I was surprised. Um, it, so we don't have 7-Eleven in Ottawa. They were bought up by Quickie, which is a local uh, okay. convenience store uh, company. They've been around for over 50 years. And there's one just over at the corner, 150 meters from my front door. And I'll stop in and, you know, pick up chips or snacks. And it's like, okay, how much? A tall boy. Now, it's Labatt Blue, but I'm going to give you an example because everybody knows what that is. Mm -hmm. A tall boy, 473 milliliter can is $1.68. Hmm. that is cheaper than the liquor store. Wow. I was shocked. The wines they have, the only wines they have in the store, which I do agree with this, are Ontario wines. Hmm. They're cheaper than the liquor store. So that I was surprised at. I could have said something there, but... No, please do. <laughs> please do. <laughs> Ontario wines are actually pretty good. They are. I like yeah, them. pretty good, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, it, it comes down to the same, the same issue that all these governments are looking at the job of government and thinking, what can we sell off, right? Yeah. How can we, you know, make a buck on this for our friends? How can we take this filthy money out of public hands and put it in private hands where it belongs, right? Would that, would that have anything to do with Doug in, in a tunnel? <sighs> 
Yeah. So Doug's tunnel. Well, he's an asshole, so I see how that comes naturally as an idea. <laughs> oh my god! Well, I, I'm going to just say a shout out to Dan because I guarantee you, Dan's watching this. I know it's a previously recorded. We're, we're not. We're recording this live, but when we air this, it'll be a previously recorded show. But Dan, who will be watching this, who worked for Doug Ford at Deco Labels, can tell you exactly who he is yeah you know like it's it really is funny when you look at the sort of people that have ended up being in cabinet in alberta in cabinet in ontario uh in all sorts of legislatures across the united states these are people that would not have been electable right mm -hmm. 10 years ago right people with duis people with you know but fraud convictions these people just would not be electable you know, to be president or premier yeah indeed indeed so when we were talking pre-show you were mentioning something you were seeing some parallels between the 401 and a particular scenic route planned for saskatchewan <laughs> oh yes yes so the um the underground 401 is exactly the same as a proposal that's been of long standing uh, to tunnel underneath Saskatchewan from the Alberta border to the Manitoba border. We call that the scenic route. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I did not see that no. coming. <laughs> I'm out, I'm out when you can see it coming for days. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town called Stoughton, which is uh, <laughs> 80 miles from the Manitoba border and 35 miles from the U.S. border. And it's the part of Saskatchewan that you can use to set your pool table. Oh, that flat, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we were driving home in 2000. Had a brand new little Ford station wagon. And out of the corner of my eye, there are hills on the horizon. And I look and I realize that it's, it's waves of you know, the uh, glass that you can tell because the horizon is a perfect optical interference device. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but, <laughs> I, I, you know, I come by, I grew up in the bald prairie. I come by it honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about this 401 thing. The economics of this thing, right? It, it, it's not sound, right? There's no actual proof that expanding um, highway capacity actually reduces um, congestion. It's a, if you build it, they do come. Yeah, it's and people are very clever at figuring ways to get around, you know, your best intentions. And so usually the better solutions are um, things like traffic management, encouraging people to come and go at different times. Public transit is a good one, you know, mm. that would be useful. Um, we have just gotten trains in Edmonton. Um, a new LRT line, light rapid transit line has just opened up and it keeps getting hit. <laughs> Cars keep running into it. <laughs> Because, you know, it's they're just too small, those trains. They're just, nobody can see them. Can see them, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> wow. oh, it could be worse. We could cheer for the Maple Leafs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Well, you know, Leafs is an acronym, right? Uh, Losers even after 50 seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to apologize that I gotten my um, Leafs history wrong, and um, that was just totally due to the tragically hip. Ah, oh, Bill Barilko. Did you check it out? <laughs> yeah, I thought Bill Barilko was the last time they actually won a cup. It was '62 or something like that, right? Yeah. Before I was born, was their last one. Oh, was it? Oh, there you and go. '67, the last Stanley Cup. Yeah. Well. And they haven't played in the finals since, so there you go. I'm not surprised. They made one semi, right? They've they've been to the semis twice. Twice uh, in '93, Dougie Gilmore mm -hmm. uh, against the LA Kings. 
and and again in 99 against uh, Buffalo. Buffalo beat them. Buffalo went on to lose in game six, triple overtime against Dallas when Brett Hull's foot was in the crease. Back then, if you had your foot in the crease, no goal was allowed, but they had changed the rule at the beginning of the season, but they didn't tell all the refs because there were disallowed goals in the playoffs that year by other teams for the same thing. They said, well, he didn't interfere with the goalie. Well, neither did that guy or that guy. Anyway. I may have stumbled onto a sore spot. I'm sorry, Mr. Beaver. Oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm, I'm a Sens fan, so I don't care about those. Okay, people. good, good. <laughs> you switched allegiances. Uh, so um, just general overall economics. If somebody were to ask how we're doing as a nation, how is it that we're doing overall? Uh, it depends whether you ask that question from the perspective of corporations or from the perspective of citizens. Right. In general, from the perspective of citizens, um, their wages have been stagnant while prices have been rising at uh, surprising rates. Um, and that is likely to get worse. And the reason is, is that we are now pulling back from globalization. And so the cheap Chinese goods that we relied on will no longer be available. They just won't be coming. Um, and so it gets into a, a situation where most people feel like we're in a recession. Personally, for a lot of people, it feels like it's difficult to get by. But on the other hand, you look at the results for corporate Canada and gross domestic product and those sort of aggregate measures, and it looks like we're doing pretty well. Uh, particularly compared with our cohort in the world, right, in the G7. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just behind the U.S., uh, who's also going through the same sort of perturbations, um, but with fewer safety nets. So, I mean, that has to be the concern in the U.S., is that um, the social contract will totally break down in some places. Um, and you could argue that it, it almost always has. And so what we're seeing is the inevitable stagnation of capital that occurs about every four generations. Um, and usually our way out of it is some sort of general conflagration. Uh, if you look at the book, uh, The Fourth Turning, it's all about this particular phenomenon where because capital comes more easily to people that already have capital, it tends to super accumulate. Um, and unless you tax that back and put it back into the economy, uh, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the investment options that that capital seeks out are restricted. Uh, and the reason that they become restricted is that no rational investor will take a flyer on a new company uh, developing a new product when instead they could just buy your mom's house and charge her rent from now until she dies, mm -hmm. right? Um, cap markets don't do morals. And that's the thing that most people don't understand is that corporations, were they judged as a human, would be psychopathic. Right. Right. The, the decisions that are made in the best interests of business are often in the worst interests of mankind. Agreed. So if you wanted my summary of where we're at, it's, you know, once again, we've let five guys have all the fucking money and we need to get it back. And it needs to go into the hands of people who didn't spend it. It's really is economics is as simple as that. It's right. just the sum of all transactions. So if one of the federal parties wanted to be serious about getting some of it back, what, what are things that they would do? Like if they had a, like a three, four year plan, what are some of the things that would be in there to sort of get that kick started in a manner that's serious? Yeah. So the capital gains tax is the first one, right? Um, and it's probably set at a relatively, uh, probably a little bit too low of a level. Mm -hmm. Really the people that have all the money have an extraordinary amount of money. I mean, they're, you know, they're not millionaires, they're billionaires. Um, and once you've got a couple of thousand million, right, it, the world looks like a very different place. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. if I'm just trying to think of where's the logical place to go after such a dire statement, but the long and the short of it is that anybody who's saying that you need to cut taxes and that'll grow the economy are giving updated versions of Reagan's trickle, trickle down, down bullshit. Yeah. Right. And it, it's not the way that it works. Now, having said that, I, uh, as an economist, I like markets. I think markets are a wonderful innovation and do some things very, very efficiently. They're very efficient at logistics. They're very efficient at, um, you know, uh, arbitraging mm -hmm. between different uh, price regimes. They're very efficient at uh, developing new things. They're terrible at making sure that grandma doesn't die. Because if she can't pay, she can die. Is yeah. where markets go, right? They don't have morals. And um, if the business community wanted to do something significant and get me on side with, you know, cutting their tax rate, it would be to be better citizens, right? If corporations acted as better citizens uh, and supported things like universal health care or universal education. I would have a lot more patience for giving them some leeway. Um, but as it is, the things that I mentioned in terms of um, capital gains tax, the other one should be wealth tax on a personal level once you're above you know, 25 million. Uh, but then the other ones should be on corporations. So the first one I would tax would be uh, stock buybacks. Uh, they do nothing but benefit shareholders at the expense of the general economy. So would you eliminate them all together or I would just tax, or just tax, tax the shit out of them, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ninety percent tax on your stock buybacks. That would be great because right now we've seen how detrimental and destructive stock buybacks have been for for they, they've decimated economies in, in smaller communities, right? It's just just Yeah. No, it's that's the the interests of uh, those people, those executives and those corporations are to make as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're not to save the world. They're not to, you know, no. keep grandma alive. No. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think, the fundamental breakdown in our uh, society compared with what we saw, say, after World War II, was even businessmen had a sense of propriety. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my favorite example of that was the president of um, the bank that was just before Citibank, you know, the, their predecessor bank, uh, arranged a one and a half billion dollar loan for General Motors in 52. Um, his salary for the year was 200 grand and he didn't get a bonus, right? Can you imagine that now? The CEO no. making 200 grand or, you know, even a million, let's say that's the equivalent today. Uh, it's that part of it's gone all out of whack. Um, and then the other part of it that's gone all out of whack is, um, them just not participating in society, you know, saying that society is something that government has to be responsible for. Well, at the same time, trying to choke it in the bathtub, right? And <laughs> take away all of its revenue. So you end up with bad government and, you know, a bad economy. It's not a good place to be. And unfortunately, it'll probably be where we end up because people have short memories and most people don't put the two and the two together. Mm -hmm. um, they just remember that, you know, they don't like Trudeau anymore. I'm not sure why, but we don't like him anymore. And gee, Harper, he seems like a great guy. You know, like it's, yeah. it's the case that it's, it is possible to fool all the people some of the time. Clearly. Mm. Well, it's, it's a, you know, I, I was reading up on the former capital not capital gains tax, but it was a marginal tax rate. And if your company earned over, and I'll arbitrary figure, I'll say $10 million in a year, anything above that was taxed at 90% during Eisenhower's tenure as president. Mm -hmm. So what companies were doing to reduce that tax burden, if you will, was they would reinvest that money over the $10 million figure back into the company. Mm -hmm. They would, they would have training programs, they would have leasing programs, they would have uh, loan programs so that people could go out and buy their first home. They would right. pay their employees better. Right. 
and all they did was put money back into the company. And if, and it was like, you know, anything under 10 million, you paid your marginal rate of 33%. Anything over 10 million, it was 90%. Huh. So let's get that number down and reinvest into the company. So we don't have to pay as much in tax and it benefited all of society. Yes. Now, I'm just trying to think back on the time when we had stagflation, right, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. There was certainly a case to be made that the overall economy had gotten too far away from a dynamic market economy and too much into uh, an almost, um, you know, militaristic and that's where it came from, right? This this government-run economy uh, was the norm coming out of World War II mm -hmm. as that's the way that it had to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, they maybe did things a little better in the U.S., uh, counting on their um, oligarchs at the time to, you know, turn their car plants into tank plants. But um, the two things that came out of that were, one, was, it, you know, the government's place in the economy was paramount right mm -hmm. after the war and two there was an entire generation of people that had sacrificed tremendously for the common good or what they perceived to be the common good and so if you put those two things together uh, we have a society now where people don't share that sense of commonality um, there's no you know central ability to you know be part of a peace corps or Nobody wants to join the army anymore. Um, and you end up where all these selfish motives aggregated together make everything worse and everyone worse off. Mm -hmm. I, think now, when had, I was going to say that it, it came to kind of a head here in Ottawa with the uh, occupation thereof and the freedom convoy. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we also have to apologize for the Mannings, Harper, and uh, Kenny. <laughs> I could just now, go down the list. <laughs> but it's funny that you, it's interesting that you're mentioning that because you're mentioning that period of time where we had, you know, some stagflation and, and things were tough and we sort of had to come together. And we've just had another period where things were tough. Mm. We're like this, you know. It, it was yeah, a novel global. virus that came along, but all the economic fallout that that happened as a result. I mean, the world stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, time, supply chains got cut, distribution systems got cut, people stayed at sheltered at home, um, and we're emerging from that with much less solidarity going in and coming out than we had back then. Yeah. Well, the difference is we had Knowlton reading the news, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We, right. we didn't have Vladimir whispering in everybody's ear. Yeah, yeah no kidding. So we it's, have... It's all the immigrants. The immigrants are the problem. Yeah. 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 But, but we have all this going on. Because if the most sort of like give us the straight version, did our federal government and the provincial governments, because I think it might be a little different on the provincial governments than the federal, but did economically, because did they manage us well through that period um by the numbers yeah absolutely um i mean we came out like i say number two in the uh the group of seven um which is pretty extraordinary given our size mm -hmm. uh i mean the debt always comes up as an issue and it has ever since i've been an economist which is an interesting thing um, the president of NMAX once asked me what I thought about the debt crisis, and this was back in the I don't know, 2005, 2006 area, uh, where they're concerned about the amount of money that the U.S. was spending on foreign military adventures. And my question to him was, well, who's going to send the sheriffs past the 14 supercarriers? Right? Like, yeah, people don't. And so if if regular economics, if micro and macroeconomics that you, you know, you get a glimpse of in school is um, Newtonian physics, okay. monetary policy is uh, Einstein and relativistic physics, right? You can't think of money as a fixed quantity. It's just another thing that's uh, a market marker. And so 
when you start talking about things like the national debt, uh, when you've got a fiat national currency, that's a pretty different situation than being, you know, a local barbershop or a mm -hmm. household. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, by the numbers, we did very, very well. And I have to say that from those terms, the, um, the liberal government has been pretty smart and that, it includes our own, um, you know, Christian Freeland from Alberta, who's mm -hmm. deputy premier and, and a very sharp cookie, right? Like you don't get to be lead editor at the London Financial Post without knowing a thing or two about finance. Right. Well, and I saw a comment the other day, I go, what the hell? She was a journalist. What's she doing in finance? And I'm like, you do know what her job as a journalist was, right? <laughs> no, they don't. They just know she's a girl. Yeah. 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 And Trudeau was a drama teacher for one frickin' semester. Yeah. You know, can we talk about, you know, Le Petit Pou? Yes, Le Petit Pou. Uh, Le Petit Pou, Monsieur Poiliev. Oui. He, he went to the same high school as me and mm -hmm. um, uh, Ryan Jesperson. Yes. Okay. High school in Southwest Calgary. Um, where interestingly, it was always the Mormon kids who put on the beer parties. <laughs> uh, it was a very very wealthy school it's very interesting <laughs> well Mor mormons don't have rules about drinking um i used to work with a guy who was mormon and he'd, he'd he'd go out for a drink on a friday and he'd get liquored every time so maybe if they had a rule about it he clearly disregarded it altogether <laughs> well the old saying is the way to keep a Mormon from raiding your liquor cabinet is to invite a second Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> when and, and any Mormon viewers, if, if you're offended, well, it's kind of funny. Be, yeah. No, they'll be laughing because <laughs> oh <my> <laughs> they know it to be true. Well, the other is, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, since so, so we're talking about the. Le, le petit pou. The yeah. impression I got a while ago is that the economic policy that he intended to introduce was very similar to the one that Liz Truss was had tried to introduce in the UK. That mm -hmm. blew up in her face, but it may have worked here because our economic situation going into it was substantially better than the UK's, and we would have been able to mask it for a while. But I really yeah. got the impression listening to him. It's like, see what she did here? See what happened? Like, that's exactly what his blueprint over here. And now he's trying to change it on the fly because it didn't work. And, well, now we have 2% inflation. And he was banking on that not going down. And he wasn't banking on interest rates going down. So he has to change a couple of things on the fly. You know, the problem with all of those right-wing um, ideologues is that they don't understand the role of government, right? Mm -hmm. They don't understand that government is our bank of our public interest. It's where the things that we do as a society and a community go to accumulate uh, and should go to be redistributed in a way that's both fair and useful, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we've gotten into this idea that it's corporations and shareholders that own the economy. Um, and that's hogwash, right? They're, they are not good stewards of the economy. They may be good stewards of their own business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Adam Smith pretty much nailed that, that, um, because of the, the, the operation of a properly functioning market, you can count on, people's greedy interests and self-interests to get you to an optimal outcome where no one can be better off. But that's only if the markets are free, efficient, and openly competitive. And one can argue in Canada that we have very few markets that meet all those criteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's and why we, some yeah. markets I assume that we can't have just given the disparity in our low numbers, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, like it's there's a large number of things that we will never get as um, right as the United States, and part of that is because we have a tenth of the population, 
And part of that is because we can't move the most productive farmland in the world um, from beside the Mississippi and Missouri rivers where they currently reside. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's uh, it's one of our bigger problems in Canada is having to compare ourselves to what is the world's you know biggest, baddest, meanest economy. Um, and it's that way in part because of its size, mostly because of its size, but also because of its just cutthroat nature, right? Like it's, um, there is a financial efficiency to letting people starve. Mm -hmm. There's moral deficiency to that, right. but a financial efficiency. Right, right, yeah. If we listen to him he's basically telling us uh, i will ax the carbon tax meaning the carbon tax will ax the tax meaning the carbon tax and uh suddenly two million people will not have to go to food banks anymore and conversely the other side if we raise it to 61 cents a liter it's going to be nuclear winter yeah baloney meter <laughs> yeah. those are both horseshit um okay the, Can you tell us why? Well, the carbon tax was introduced by Mulro or by uh, Harper to start right. with. Um, it was a back in the days when conservatives believed in economics and thought that right. applying things transparently and um, evenly was the right way to do it. If you're going to meet the international guidelines that we have for carbon reduction, and Lord knows if we are. Um, if we're not, then we, we have a much bigger problem, mm -hmm. um, or our grandchildren have a much bigger problem, which is a big concern for me. The, um, the issue around the carbon tax is that they didn't package the rebates right. as spectacularly as they packaged the tax. Right. And that was dumb. Right. Um, for most people, they're going to be made worse off because they will not get the carbon rebates. Um, and so the notion that the carbon tax was going to be responsible for creating, you know, mass um, starvation is stupid on its face. And as you dig deeper, it just gets stupider, right? Because you have to replace it with something. Right. So what are you going to replace it with, uh, little flea? Is the question, and every all the options are, as Scott Mo admitted, involuntarily more expensive and less efficient. Yeah, right. Like it's again, just, it's the most inherently conservative way to go about it. Yeah, but politics beats economics every time. Right. Right, and so you have the problem that there's very few people in this country that have the guts to stand up and say, "Well, that's bullshit." Right, the, the, too many people are too concerned with getting along in their their group of friends, uh, as opposed to doing what's right for everyone. Um, and maybe that's the thing that got worse during the pandemic was we, you know, lost the social circles that we used to have, whether that was work or school or church or wherever it was. Um, but if we don't think of the public good and we don't think of helping our neighbors and we don't think of you know being good community members we're going to live in shitty hell holes yes I mean, that's the way that that cookie crumbles. you can you know i always remember my uh u.s history prof in my undergrad saying you want to know the difference between the u.s and canada go to the top of the tallest building in calgary go to the top of the petrocan building get on the 61st floor and look out and try and spot the ghettos. You won't, right? We, we have a very different system than the U S right. We should be proud of that system, right. not denigrating it. And right. the people that think that were we to become more like the U S that they would be the ones on top need to give their head a shake, right? Like they really do. I, I've been very lucky. I grew up on a farm. We didn't realize we were poor until we left. Right. 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 Um, but it became pretty self-evident once we left the farm. But on the other hand, my parents were very insistent that we all take, you know, practical degrees. 
Um, and so all five of us did. And we've all done very well for ourselves. Um, very, very lucky timing to be born, you know, outside of any major global wars. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, people behind me, which is anybody born uh, after 63, are going to have a very difficult time trying to, you know, replicate what I was able to do or what any of my siblings were able to do because those jobs just aren't there, right? There's no opportunity for them to get out of school and go be an economist, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're going to have to intern somewhere for some rich jackass um, for a period yeah. of time, which, you know, gets to another situation that tends to happen in societies, which is that as wealth accumulates into fewer and fewer families, the elites tend to get dumber and dumber. Um, and the reason is simple, is that men are chosen for mating purposes, typically on the basis of how much they've gotten their wallets, as well as some physical attractiveness. Uh, whereas women are often chosen exclusively on physical attractiveness and you know, aren't necessarily the sharpest tools in the shed in these rich marriages. <laughs> and intelligence tends to come from the maternal bloodline. Well, I've so, watched uh, like five minutes of one of those Real Housewives series. I don't know. There's like a dozen yeah. of them. Yeah. Five minutes, and that was all I could take. <laughs> well, it shouldn't take you much time in the company of rich people to realize rich people are no smarter than anybody else, right? They're just richer. Yeah, and it. a lot of in a lot of cases they're dumber, right? Because they don't have to be exposed to the realities that the rest of us have to face, right? Well, you know, it's there's so much truth to that because they're isolated and insulated, and they they don't they don't know what it's like to you know have to roll quarters to buy a box of KD at the corner store at the last minute because you've got nothing else in the fridge, right? right? They have no concept of what's that what that's like. They 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 don't they can't even begin to understand. As a matter of fact, there was a a, a woman from Saskatchewan who was acting on a show, uh, a show was called Superstore. Mm -hmm. And, and she played, uh, she was like a, she was a bigger gal, but she was like a super corporate, uh, security. Uh, anyway, she's, her, her character was brilliant. And I was watching an interview with her on TikTok, and she, they, they said, so when you first came here from small town Saskatchewan, what was the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in, you know, in Hollywood? She said, we went, uh, met some people, and I got invited to a dinner at their home. I don't know how this happened. I don't remember the circumstances. But I remember that when when we finished eating, they threw everything out. And, and I was like, no, 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 no. It was a catered dinner. They threw the plates, the cutlery, actual silverware. They threw it in the garbage. It wasn't like take out boxes of Thai food and the little cardboard thing with a plastic fork. They threw the dishes out because, well, why would I clean them? <laughs> Literally, that was their philosophy. And she came from, like I said, small town Saskatchewan. She was, her mind was completely blown. She's like, I don't know if I can handle this out here. Um, well, and the other thing it does if you do that is it makes sure that no one else can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It's back to that pathology that... I've seen many times where people will actively go out of their way to ensure that something they have is not available to others. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, this, I knew one woman who, if she found um, a shirt she would like, she would buy up everyone in the store. So right? nobody not else that she was going to wear them herself because they'd be in the wrong sizes. Right. But so no one else would be seen in the same thing. There's, there's a wow. deep, yeah, pathology in our great ape nature, right? I, the biggest single breakthrough I've had in my career as an economist is to stop thinking of people as people and start thinking of them as apes um, because that gives you a better indication of what they're likely to do in any given situation. And a lot of it comes down to what's my status in the immediate pecking order of apes around me. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get into all of these very strange and very selfish things, right? Of it's not about me enjoying this thing. It's about me having this thing, which elevates my status, which is what I enjoy. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wild. Which gets us back to Doug Ford. <laughs> Please <laughs> tell us about Doug Ford. 
Uh, I'm just trying to cheer you guys up. I mean, that is always the problem with that, economics, right? Isn't yeah. That yeah. Well, you know, because, yeah, I, I understand that. If you're talking about a situation, economics, as we are, and you're looking more than, you know, like, for example, you could be looking, hey, the TSX hit a record high today. Everybody's, uh, you know, if you have some pension investments or whatnot, you probably did good today. Everybody celebrate. Isn't everything great? But that that's the tree. And then if you back up, okay, 20, 30, 40 years, I mean, we're not setting ourselves up well energy-wise as it needs to be. Uh, we, we have some provinces that are very, uh, even the provinces that are very dependent on hydroelectricity and saying, well, you know, they're getting a clean energy boost. Water's drying up. Mm. They're going to have to replace that electricity somehow. I just heard something on the news today about, about that, that, you know, there's a, that there's, if you had to like make sure that you, you can regenerate the same amount of electricity and you have to count for population growth. There's, there's a lot of places that are just so far behind. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have other situations like provinces, like in Alberta, where most of the electricity comes from, I think, natural gas. Does now, yes. Does yes. now. So if we're going to move away from, if we're going to move to something more green and whatnot, they've got a larger percentage of households to switch over to a new thing than any but than anybody else that's ha already has some type of mix which is more expensive and i guess that's why daniel smith is kind of saying that we can't do this by 2035 i don't know if that's actually true or not but okay so, so yeah you hit the rant button <laughs> oh does, does, does so daniel let's talk smith, about alberta's electricity system does daniel smith know about the faucet because you know. <laughs> What Daniel Smith doesn't know will fill a very large stadium. <laughs> so well, here's the problem yeah. in Alberta. If it's not combustion, it's communism. Right. 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 Yeah. They have gone out of their way to kill what was the most successful green energy sector in North America. Right. Yes. And the reason it was successful was because we have a free and open market. Uh, that people were able to come in and do deals such that a wind generator could, um, you know, supply all the IKEA stores, right, mm -hmm. for example. And those sort of deals are allowed and easy to transact in Alberta. These fucking guys are so dead set against green energy and think that it's an existential threat to the oil business as opposed to the oil business being an existential threat to the human species, mm -hmm. that they have stopped it cold. Uh, they put in ridiculous um, regulations that you can't have wind turbines visible, basically, right? You need to figure out how to make invisible wind turbines to satisfy their legislation. Um, and they're uh, condemning us to a world of expensive, in, uh, unreliable electricity because they don't know what they're doing. If, on the other hand, we had a sensible government, they would say, hey, we're worried that the world's going to stop using our major commodity sometime in the next five to 50 years. Mm -hmm. But it's within a lifetime we know that the end of this sector will be will be done what are we going to do instead and they would go hey there's going to be a hundred million f electric pickup trucks in the u.s mm -hmm. they don't have enough power they want more green power desperately uh so much so that um who was it um it wasn't peter Thiel, but it was one of those guys mm -hmm. Uh, said to Biden, hey, you, we need to become really, really big friends with um, Canada because we need so much more power for um, artificial intelligence that there's no way we can supply it. I think it was, uh, wasn't it, uh, uh, what's his name from Facebook? Uh, it was, yeah, it was one of those guys. Yeah, it was uh, one of them. Yeah. One of them. Um, the long and the short of it is we have the largest green energy potential mm -hmm. of anywhere in the world pretty much 
in Western Canada. If BC got together with Alberta and Saskatchewan, and Alberta and Saskatchewan generated wind power to their greatest extent possible, which is like 100,000 megawatts of power, right? It's huge. That's massive. Um, you cooperate with BC so that that power could be firmed up using the capacity of their existing hydro dams, they would get additional value out of their existing hydro dams at the same time getting power at around four cents a kilowatt hour from Alberta at the same time as facilitating a major green energy export to the United States down through Montana. If we had a government that wasn't us all in on black. I have absolutely no uh, qualms that we would be right now going back and forth between here and Washington, figuring out how to get that green power to Nevada or California. Mm -hmm. They're going to need it and they want it. But we're all in on black and, you know, we just, we're just going to, you know, well, the, the, I'm surprised well, I, we haven't gone back to coal, to be well, honest. Well, they we want to. We have more nostalgia for coal in Alberta than they have in Kentucky. <laughs> they want to, though. Jason Kenney wanted to, to farm out a mountain to an Australian company and mine it for coal. Oh, they still do, even though it's been um, rejected by mm -hmm. the Energy Board. They yeah. resuscitated the goddamn thing. Yeah. Um, Grassy Mountain, it's called. Yeah. And it's um, just in time for the Swedes to develop a fully carbon neutral steel making process. The only reason they're mining that coal is for metallurgical uh, steel making. And people are finding ways that you can make steel without carbon, without coal. Mm. So it's, you know, like their timing is impeccable. They're just the stupidest bunch of hicks you could ever want to run into. And, and you look um, at the, the Saudi Arabia, who is expanding their economy outside of oil because they know it's going to dry up. Dubai yeah. started that 30 years ago, 34 years ago, they said, we're going to run out of oil soon. We need to diversify our economy. They've gone into IT. They've gone into tourism. They've done all kinds. Well, you look at the city of Dubai. Yeah. Right? Well, just circle back to Norway. Right? Exactly. We know we can't rely on this forever. So let's diversify. Let's and put money was, into this. And that was evident right from the beginning. I mean, the, the tragedy of Alberta is that we started off with Lockheed and we've ended up with Smith. <laughs> right? Mm. Like yeah. what a degradation of talent. Yeah. And all because there are jackasses in Alberta. They're, you know, shining examples of C minus students who sit in their coffee shops on every morning when they're not on the tractor, thinking they're the kings of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there's nothing that anybody could tell them about how things work. And um, I'm sure you get it in rural Ontario too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. There's nobody who knows more than a, than a farmer off his tractor. He's um, never been outside of the community. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it, I, I just have to give my head a shake at some point. Um, we're not knocking farmers, by the way, just, you know, for viewers. And listeners, we're personality not. types. It's personality types. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I've known doctors who are just as stupid. Right? Uh, and lawyers. Right. right. Like it's important to know where you know stuff and where you don't. Mm -hmm. Right. If, there, if yeah. there was one thing that I was going to tell you, it would be that. Um, I know I'm not that smart. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, it's, I'm not the smartest guy in my family. Hmm. So um, I try and stay humble. On the but other I, hand. You know, I, I can say I'm the smartest guy in this room. I'm the only guy in this room. <laughs> I would say that too, except I've got some computers in here that are pretty hot rod. Mm. Um, <laughs> anyway where are we at um doug ford i, I had pressed your red button <laughs> <laughs> I, I just i cannot honestly believe what they've done to what should have been a shining oh, yeah. star of the alberta electric system um mm. the the path we were on was to be new zealand Mm -hmm. where we have a, a, an abundance of options for renewable energy. They're all efficient. They're all cost competitive. We could have been New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead, we are Texas with um, occasional prices of a dollar a kilowatt hour. 
um, and um, intermittent reliability at best. Yeah, and, and look now, what happened to, to Texas in the last two winters, right? Well, they have the same problem as us. They have a market that only pays for generation. They have an energy-only electricity market. And in order for that to be reliable, you need to set the maximum price uh, such that you can build uh, backup plants. You can. The way you get reliability in electricity is by having backup after backup after backup. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to do that in an energy only market, you need to have a price uh, peak of about twenty to thirty thousand dollars per megawatt hour, uh, which is twenty to thirty dollars per kilowatt hour, which means that your house is going to cost you, I don't know, a hundred bucks to run today. Right. For today, not for the month, just for today. That's expensive. Yeah. Um, and the that was the political problem with both here and Texas is that they never accepted that um, you would have to have prices that high in order to have reliability mm. and have pointed in every direction but their peak price as to why we have a problem. Uh, typically, they try and blame it on renewables, uh, at which point I ask, well, how much do we pay renewables to be backup? Because number one, it's a really stupid idea. <laughs> And number two, you know, you, you couldn't buy it for love or money, right? Like mm. You've got wind, it's going to blow and or it's going to generate when the wind is blowing. And there's nothing you can do about that. But you don't ask it to be backup power. And we right. don't pay them anything to be backup power. So mm. it's just the craziest um, flip on its head scenario of any that I've seen. But a lot of people fall for it because they don't understand it. So when Daniel... Uh, Smith was walking all around the province, turning around, talking about saying, you know, I need to secure base load, secure base load. Was she flipping that equation? No. Saying that we can't keep this, this, this is planning like to keep the renewables for backup. And so you have to understand, we don't, front? we, that's a concept from fully integrated, fully regulated utility system planning. Right. In the world I grew up in, that's what I did. That was my job. I mm -hmm. would forecast out 50 or 100 years of load. And then we figure out what we we're going to do to meet that load efficiently. Right. Uh, and so we looked at a variety of hydro stations versus um, thermal stations. And that was where that sort of calculus comes in. Uh, base load is the notion that there is always an amount that you're going to be using. And that uh, the most efficient way to provide that is to have big plants that run flat out 24 hours a day, right? Okay. That's, that's what base load is supposed to be. Okay. We don't do that and haven't done that since 1999. We count on the market to provide new plants when new plants are needed. But the problem is that that price signal is muted because they've put the cap at a dollar a kilowatt hour when it needs to be at 20 or 30, mm. right? So you've never had the incentive to come and build backup generation in uh, Alberta or Texas because of the way that the markets are set up. Not for any other reason, just because of that. It just doesn't make sense to build a plant that's only going to run 70 hours a year at these prices. Mm. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Now Alberta has this other thing that's unique that we were trying to wrap our heads around when we were trying to explain it, but we didn't quite get it called economic withholding. Because uh, I remember seeing the Statistics Canada thing at one point saying that the price of energy had gone up 123% year over year, I think, between like mm -hmm. June and June. Like, well, what? How the hell did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the problem. When you've got a fully efficient market, uh, when you've got a market like we do, and it's oversupplied, nobody makes no money. <laughs> right. When it's undersupplied, everybody makes all the money. So the unique part about the way our market works is that everybody gets paid the price of the highest unit, the highest price unit that got uh, dispatched. 
So if the highest price unit that got dispatched was half a cent a kilowatt hour, everybody gets paid half a cent a kilowatt hour. If the highest price per unit dispatched was 50 cents a kilowatt hour, everybody gets paid 50 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, up to the maximum of a dollar. And so uh, we have this thing in Alberta where if you have enough market power to be able to drive the price up by withholding some of that supply from the market, mm. either by pricing it out of contention or by just stopping it, um, you can drive the price up for all of your other units. And so that's what happened was these guys, these effing guys, threw out the work that the New Democrats had done in fixing the problem of unreliable, expensive capacity in the Alberta electricity market, uh, which was uh, the, the NDP solution had been to create a capacity market like they do in Massachusetts and other places. Hmm. Um, but they tossed that out and reinstituted economic withholding, which had already been used once before at that point by TransCanada uh, from 2013 to about 2015, where they had enough market power to drive the price up. Um, and it was such a big deal that I actually built an app for my um, consulting business that would tell people what the price was at any point in time. Um, so when the NDP got in, that stopped right away. And then when the UCP got in, they said, well, we'll allow that back in. And then what happened was Transalta got back all of its plants, which had been the, the output of which had been sold off in privatization. Uh, they got the plants back and um, went to town <laughs> from midnight on January 1, 2021, until just recently. Um, and they were successfully able to five times the price, essentially, for four years. And this was defended as being extraordinarily efficient for some period of time until it was obvious to even the dullest of the UCP cabinet members that that was not the case, right? That something was seriously wrong and you're ruining the rest of the economy for the benefit of four big energy suppliers. Wasn't, wasn't that kind of what Enron did in California a bunch of years back? Enron did in California, and it's exactly the Enron model that we've got. So, yeah, yeah good one. That's what I thought, because the way you described it, I'm like, that's what Enron did. If if I had a bell on the desk, I would be ringing it. I, could hear the piano <laughs> I, I got Tucker uh, cost the mouth again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, what, that's exactly what Enron did. I remember when that was taking place. And, yeah. Okay. And, Who's the genius that said, hey, Enron, let's get ourselves a slice of that? <laughs> Ralph Klein. And, oh, um, his buddy, Steve Smith, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith. And then, uh, the, yeah, the guy who submitted it was Mel Knight under, um, Stelmach. So, yeah. And that's when I left the provincial government, um, it was under Stelmach in 2009 and they really ticked me off. I fired a friend of mine for just being a friend of mine. Um, so I let him have it. I was on the front page of the newspaper more often than the premier for the summer of 2009. And that's when I joined the Wild Rose because these stupid conservatives had to go. And, you know, plus I chance, plus I remember. Plus mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, huh? yeah, very much so. That, uh, the the so, PR guy in me is very, very, very happy and pleased about the part of you being on the front page more often. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> but for the right that, reason. That's the whole thing. It's like, we mentioned that, right? We talk often about, uh, I keep on bringing up uh, Munir Sheikh, who was the head of Statistics Canada. Mm -hmm. When Prime Minister Stephen Harper's turned around and says, no, no, we, we won't do collect our data the way that we collected it before. We'll collect it this way. And trust me, like this, the reliability of the data will be just the same, if not better. And like Trust the head me, of Statistics bro. Canada sit there going like, this. well, everybody that works in my industry knows that if we do it this way, it's not better. So I can either sit here and say nothing and have all my peers laugh at me behind my back, even though I'm in my dream job, mm -hmm. or I could have some integrity and say, 
yeah, what you said is not true, and I can't sanction that by remaining in this job. Sorry, I, I got to go, even though this is my dream job. Mm -hmm. Was the job that you had when you were the utilities consumer advocate, was that a job that you really, really enjoyed and you would have loved to stay in otherwise? Yeah, and I was very, very good at it. Um, we cost utilities about $500 million in requested rate increases. So um, that accrues every year. Yeah. No, I was... Uh, I would have been very happy to stay there and very been very good at it, but it comes down to, um, yeah, ethics isn't worth a paycheck. Right. Yeah. Because essentially if you stayed there, they would be making you say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the person that, so I got fired in large part because I told them that their idea to allow every transmission project that had ever been proposed to be built all at once was a really, really stupid idea. Um, and they went ahead and did it anyway. <laughs> so it was before they made that decision, but after I had left, they um, brought in a, a lady named Karen Gashus who was vice president at Fortis, I believe, before uh, coming to run the Utilities Consumer Advocate. Very, very, very bright lady, uh, very knowledgeable about the industry. She commissioned a study that came up with the same conclusion I did, which was, this is stupid. Um, and had the minister and deputy minister come in and yell at her for an hour and a half in her office. Um, you know, she left shortly after that. There, I mean, you have to have a bit of a tough skin to take mm -hmm. on the kind of jobs, but you also have to be a bit of a badass. And the one thing that never happened to me was nobody ever came into my office and yelled at me. It just wasn't going to happen. Right. Right. I'm telling well, you, they'd get a one time. It shouldn't even. It shouldn't even be a concern. It, it shouldn't be a concern. Should. But it is, unless you're 6'4", 230, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, which you one? are? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> it kind of helps. <laughs> I got you know. yelled at once. So, but I was 5'6", 140 so <laughs> at the time. So, yeah, was, I can see why I got yelled at. That was the at. thing my buddy pointed out to me this summer. He goes, did you notice anything about Calgary while you were here? I go, yeah, I'm not that tall around here. I'm six foot. Mm. So in Ottawa, I'm above average but in, in calgary no man everybody's like three or four inches taller than me those big prairie boys are tall yeah <laughs> well, like, we eat good. Uh, yeah like <laughs> i mean i was and, and my buddy goes strange right i go yeah i'm not used to this you know usually i'm one of the taller people in the in the building and the, you know, wherever i am but it's but but yeah i wasn't and it was weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know like it's it's a funny world we live in, right? But if you get back to the, um, what would an ape do? Mm. I'm pretty good at ape things. <laughs> Hulk smash? <laughs> uh, no, I just get very quiet. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm. That's scarier. The, the yes. radiating disapproval mm -hmm. is extremely effective. Irish Catholic over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether that makes you better at it or worse. I understand it. <laughs> Let's <put> it that <laughs> way. <laughs> I dated a woman years ago. Uh, she, she's Jewish. And she said, you know, if we both had amnesia, we'd still remember the guilt. <laughs> uh, that's good. Oh, it works. It's, uh, Oh, cool. uh, Dave, is the, for anybody, it's kind of a bleak question because I understand what you're saying that we're on the downslope and we seem to be accelerating and picking up speed um, until we hope, how do I put it this way? If we are in the market for politicians as we are in three provinces currently and might soon be federally this, on anything having to do with energy or even just like affordability. What are the things that we should be listening for people to be saying if we want to know that they actually have our best interest at heart rather than some 
someone, well, people that are looking to, you know, fleece grandma and make away with all the money? Sure. If I can, let me separate it between electricity and oil and gas. Mm -hmm. In electricity, what's happening is a revolution. Um, and it's not in utility equipment. It's in consumer equipment that you can now effectively go out and buy your own power plant, right? It's a choice as to whether or not you want to stay attached to the grid. Um, and anywhere in Canada, you can create a system um, with some combination of electricity and, uh, well, with, I guess what I'm saying is you may need to have some additional thermal generation, but for the most part, for most parts of Canada, uh, people are going to be able to provide their own electricity and their own heating through heat pumps mm -hmm. uh, without being attached to anything else, right? And that's revolutionary. And if the utilities are smart, what they would do would be to take advantage of that and develop the protocols to cooperate back and forth between the utility equipment and the consumer's equipment to get the most out of it. So just as one example, um, there's a problem on AC electric circuits uh, called uh, power factor, which is when the timing of electricity is off. It's like the timing is off in your car, right? Where it wants to push, it's off just a little bit and it's not being very efficient. You can fix that if you have um, local inverters, because inverters can uh, reconfigure the electricity back into being in phase. So that would be a perfect example of where utilities, if they were on the ball, would start going to their customers and finding a way to coordinate what they're doing with what the utility needs to reduce everyone's costs. None of them are doing that yet because they're all still just desperately clinging onto their old business model. But let's go back to let's go to oil and gas because this is uh, an issue where it really comes to light that we are not a country. I can readily see a situation where the United States stops all exports of oil products from the United States. Mm -hmm. If there is a crisis in the Gulf of Hormuz and right. the oil oil. Uh, world oil prices go crazy. I can see them cutting off supply to everyone else uh, if there was a security of supply issue. That means you are screwed in Eastern Canada, like screwed, blued, and tattooed, right? If oil gets shut off from um, Gulf of Hormuz, who are you going to buy from, right? Yeah. Like all of the refineries in Eastern Canada are set up for light, sweet, Arabian crude, and it's not going to be there. Mm -hmm. So the whole Energy East pipeline debacle was framed the wrong way from my perspective. It shouldn't have been framed as an economic issue. It should have been framed as a strategic issue that in times of crisis, we need to be able to heat homes in Ontario and Quebec even if we can't get oil from Saudis. But they didn't do that. And instead, what we've ended up with is this divide in the country between, you know, the rolling coal Albertans and the wannabe green Quebecers and the we're not sure what we are Ontarians, but we need more highways. Um, and it was, to my mind, just a calamity. We should be supplying Canadians with Canadian energy just for purely strategic security right. of supply re mm -hmm. reasons. Um, and if we had that, we wouldn't have this issue of not wanting to accept environmental regulations from Ottawa in Edmonton, right? There has been no allowance given to the importance of the Alberta energy sector to the to the country. Um, and even worse than that, it's been made out as a criminal, um, which perhaps in some ways they are. <laughs> I like I, I 
oil guys that knew that the world was going to be in catastrophe if we continued on the path of of oil i i that's a very 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 evil thing to do mm -hmm. right um right. but <laughs> if you still want to heat your home in Saguenay and the Audis and the Saudis won't sell you any oil, where are you going to get it from? Because it might not be available from the U.S. either. So to my mind, that would have been one thing that could have been done that would have improved the situation we're at. Uh, but right now, I'm just hoping that we get uh, an NDP government in Alberta that can restart the green energy sector. Uh, I'm doing work right now on a, on a, a study to share with Warren Buffett and other influential American energy guys um, to kickstart a green energy superpower in Western Canada. I mean, we should be producing as much energy and sending it south as Quebec and Ontario do. Indeed. Well, especially considering that, you, you know, in, in Alberta, that they had so many green energy programs because of the fact that you, you don't have hydropower. It's just yeah. not a thing. There's like what, a, I think there's a single hydroelectric dam in the province? Um, there's a couple, and there's a potential for one fairly major one up in the northern part of the province. Uh, do you know where most of the hydro potential is in Canada? It's in the Northwest Territories. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, there's like 50,000 megawatts of hydro potential untapped in the Northwest Territories. Wow. It's, uh, but that's, you know, again. It, the distribution grid for that is going to cost billions to build, though. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you know, that's but it's clean utility. energy. That's the utility business. I was yeah. once asked by a new assistant deputy minister, um, to explain the electricity business to her. And this was, I don't know, my fourth or fifth assistant deputy minister. So I tended to be curter as they went along. <laughs> and I said, do you know the hay bales, the 40 pound square hay bales? Imagine those made of $100 bills and imagine one of those going by about every 30 seconds. That's the electricity business. It's the world's largest rent to own industry. Hmm. Hmm. And so, yes, it's going to cost billions of dollars, but everything in the utility business costs billions of dollars. So right. <laughs> that's the way it is. Right? You mentioned something in the previous answer about possibility of some global shock event that would come that would make the u.s want to retain its oil and not export it mm -hmm. um it kind of and people getting caught off guard when that should happen and it kind of reminds me of relatively recently where with the whole explosion i think it is of the whole shale gas thing that suddenly the country that was our largest purchaser became our biggest competitor Mm -hmm. right. night. And we weren't ready for that either. No. We are remarkably short-sighted. Even in Utopia, there is myopia. <laughs> good to that. Good to know. Well, and, and we've had we've had successive governments in the past that said, well, we're not we're not using this thing, so we'll just sell it off. We'll just get rid of this. And and I'm specifically going back to Mulroney on this one. I mean, sure, I touched on Air Canada earlier, but he sold off our vaccine manufacturing facilities. Mm -hmm. And and we, we got caught with our pants down during the during COVID, during the pandemic. It's like we had to import. We had to now thankfully our government bought enough to supply every Canadian with everything that they needed. Many chose not to, but that's their decision. That's fine. But you know, now now we're building plants for vaccine manufacturers and they're gonna be owned by the government of Canada, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, we have to grow up that there's more than one, there's, there's more than two types of economics, right? Mm -hmm. We have this idea that it's either laissez-faire capitalism or it's communism, right? And then there's nothing in between. And it's stupid. All, all of the there Nordic are, countries there, would have to argue with that one. Well, you know, like there's just, there's many, many options between uh, government ownership and distribution of, of goods and services and uh, laissez-faire capitalism distribution of goods and services. Because it all, in terms of humans, they accomplish the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I need food, I can go get food, right? Whether that comes from 
the government store that comes from Safeway. Right. If the prices were the same, I'm not sure I'd care. Um, and it really gets back to uh, the most remarkable piece of propaganda, I think, in, in Western civilization, which was Milton Friedman's uh, laissez-faire tour uh, just in uh, advance of Reagan, right? Yeah. So it was, was... It really destroyed our future. Yeah, no, Milton Friedman was an asshole. Um, and I think the reason he was an asshole is that he has absolutely or had absolutely no musical ability. Yeah. People that can't become a tune that just don't get music uh, are missing something. I think it has a lot to do with empathy and, you know, mm -hmm. proper human functioning. Well, he placed but, the shareholder above everything else. And I mean, this is where we are today because of that, right? That's exactly it. I mean, his line was that the only uh, requirement of management of a company was to return money to shareholders and that everything else was uh, ancillary and inefficient. And, well, that's horseshit. Uh, because what it turns out is that a poorly functioning society is inefficient as hell. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Like... Um, and again, I go back to when you think of the men and women that came out of the Depression and World War II, they understood how important community was and how important that uh, collective action was. Mm -hmm. And what resulted was decades of increasing prosperity and uh, for the first time in human history, a thriving middle class. People don't realize how rare that is. And that the natural state of uh, lazy fair economics is Charles Dickens, England. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, that's just the math. That's the way it's going to work. So, unfortunately, we now have to undo, what is it now, 50 years of propaganda along the lines of everything that government does is inefficient and everything that industry does is, is golden. Um, and it's just not the case. And in every successful economy, including the United States, it's some mix of government and private interests that mm -hmm. give you innovations that, you know, reduce costs for things that improve living standards and, um, you know, raise wages. What was it? Mm -hmm. Pierre Polyev or Jeff Polyev, whatever his name is in his yearbook, his high school yearbook, his graduation photo, his quote. What is truly abhorrent is the current welfare state. Yeah, you know. We're conservatives. We don't believe in big projects like that. The, the problem with it is that it's very easy to get people to think that they are uniquely virtuous. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's very mm. difficult to make people think that, hey, maybe I am being a selfish shit. Yeah. Mm. It's like and have them feel good about it. Like my Aunt Carol said, crazy people never stop to wonder, wait a minute, am I crazy here or? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, some people just don't have the wiring for it. True. Um, some people are trained out of it. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. But I was wondering, was there anything that you proactively would like to talk about or bring up or a message that you would like to leave uh, our kids with something that they should know that we haven't on, touched on yet? Well, I mean, our biggest concern out here right now, and I think you guys share it, is watching the slow collapse of our healthcare system. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's really disturbing. That's frightening. It's, yeah, it's, it's really troublesome. It scares the hell out of me. It does, well, because if Alberta falls, who's next, right? There's the perfect example of public good, right? There's, and this one sort of strikes home to me because my grandfather on this small town farm north of, at that time, New Hope, Saskatchewan, uh, in the house that was built in 1902 by a young man named Mr. Poole, went on to do fairly well for himself. Um he organized the farm uh, farmers around our little town to each chip in $5, which in 1902 was like 
I don't know, a thousand. Mm -hmm. A lot of money. A lot of money. Um, and what they did was to hire a physician from England and bring him over as a community. Um, now, that was sort of the start of my, you know, prairie pragmatism. And where we have a problem, we can solve it together, right? Um, and of course, what ended up happening out of that Saskatchewan experiment was Medicare, right? And it was a tremendous advantage for us as a country because it it's it gets into issues of risk and insurance, right? Mm -hmm. It comes down to that the best way to give people quality health care is, you know, in in the main, a centralized system, right? Uh, and uh, communism, <laughs> you know, the, the, the means of production are owned by workers. And That's socialism, it, yeah. You know, communism is when the means of production are owned. Socialism is just when we all get together, right? So if we own the, if we own the hospitals as a province, right, and staff it up, it's, it's communism. Let's call it what it is. Uh, but it works. It works for that. And the reason is simple, is that life and death and health are terrible candidates for market allocation mechanisms, right? When you're on your death pay, it is the easiest time to get you for another couple of grand. Right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so that's what you see in the U.S. That's mm -hmm. why they have such expensive health care with such terrible outcomes is that they've let that take its natural course. So I think that medical care, um, as the Americans would call it, or, you know, socialized health care, as we call it, has been a tremendous benefit for this country, and we should be making the most of it. But of course, the the view is, is that anybody who's on a government payroll is a leech and must be removed mm -hmm. from it, uh, much like Polly Ebb said. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how the guy can say that, well, at the same time, having a $220,000 a year pension coming on top of his, what, 500 grand a year he makes now? A two-decade career on the government payroll. And his Being on the government payroll is terrible. Makes chef. an awful person. Yeah. So, so getting back to what do we need overall, we need some people that look at the common good, the public good, as being something that we value. And maybe putting a number on it. And maybe telling people that in terms of what you're receiving, you're getting, you know, $30,000 worth of services for your $28,000, right? It is it is possible to be grown-ups about the very complicated world of economics and society and politics, um, but you have to use more than three word phrases to get there. Noun the verb. Verb the noun, sorry. Do you think yeah. we would be advantaged if there were, I'm not sure, sure if there's a standardized way, but if there was a way that we could be told about or, or a sign of cost value to those things that people call the intangibles or at least the opportunity cost? Because like, for example, with what Danielle Smith is doing on with the renewables, right? They'll say, oh, well, you know, we're going to save X number of million dollars by not building this. Yeah, but what about the opportunity cost? Mm hmm we don't know, like, we're saving $150 million not doing that in exchange for potentially losing, you know, a $50 billion over, like, 10 years at its peak opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, that seems like a oh, bad deal. It's even worse than that. Uh, wind power is the cheapest power we have by almost an order of magnitude. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it was a terrible, terrible, rotten, dumb decision made by stupid people for ridiculous reasons is that something we should start asking then is that something we should start asking like what's the opportunity cost of this of not doing this or what's the you know okay yeah, yeah but what yeah. about the, what are the alternatives yeah you know yeah. it's the, the reasonable question to ask is what are the alternatives what are the benefits what are the costs and if you really want to get into it you do the full mba and you go what are the strengths what are the weaknesses mm -hmm. right Right. I mean, who, who asked that question? Me. Opposition leader, the opposition uh, MPs, like who asked that question and why isn't it being asked? It used to That's be the journalists, problem. right? It used they to don't be... anymore. They don't answer. They don't ask questions anymore. They just uh, don't. No, 
Well, and you know, the, the reason I think is that you hit on earlier that, that all the newspapers are owned by the same rich folks. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's problematic. And to the point that I think we need non-governmental or sorry, non-political entities in our political system. We need non-partisan um, institutions other than the ones that are set up for selfish reasons like the Fraser Institute. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, Alberta owes um, Canada quite the apology for the work of the Fraser Institute and the Mannings. I'm sorry, Jim, excuse. I'm not going to argue with you, sir. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't expecting you to. I wasn't. I, I would. I would wait just as long for uh, something about Doug Ford. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's it. It really has come to the point where I don't trust political parties to be honest. I mm -hmm. don't trust them to be responsible to the public good. And I don't trust them to be responsible for anything other than their own very, very partisan selfish interests. And and that is really sad, but I, you're not the only person who thinks that way today, sir. Right. And it's sad, but, but it's come to that because we don't have journalists demanding the questions and asking the questions that we once did. Opposition leaders get 30 seconds to ask a question and you usually can barely hear them because they're being screamed at so loudly by the other. It's just... The erosion of democracy is what we're seeing in, in real time, and, and it, it really troubles me. Yeah, and so I think what we need to do is to create a network of like-minded people um, that do some of that homework of democracy. I mean, that's really what we're talking about, is mm -hmm. that we don't have any means by which to fact check what's being said. And we don't have any means by which to search for alternatives other than the ones that are proposed. Um, and as a fascinating aside to that, in a two-party system, um, game theory will always lead you to two wildly different solutions, usually quite far away from the optimum. Right. So that's, uh, you know, that's another thing to, to mull over. But certainly one of the things that I've been looking at is uh, one of the things called a citizens research forum. And really the idea was to put together thousands of people to look into these questions and provide those answers on a, um, you know, a sort of volunteer think tank basis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. of, this is the stuff we need to know to be good citizens. Um, and so let's go find it out. It's not that difficult. And most people have done more difficult things for work than, than they would have to do to be a member of parliament. You know, that's the scary part. True that. <laughs> there are yeah. a lot of heavy lifting. Yes. It seems that we're a little far from uh, Verum in Imperio. So I just have to ask, why wouldn't you go up? Why would you Why would you think you've got to go under? Yeah. You've got, you got 18 lanes of 401. Yeah. Why would you think you could go under when you could just, you know, build another one on top? Which they've done around the world anyway. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I just I uh, I know like, I, I know I, I yeah. The simple solution is just to uh, eliminate the tolls for trucks on and let them take the four hundred seven, a highway that's already there. It's already well, there. You know, it's um, traffic is always going to be bad in Toronto. Um, Period. Toronto's an hour and... from Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it, you know, it is such a lovely city ruined by traffic um, and politics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, do I have do a I do enjoy whenever I get to come and visit. We'll pay that <laughs> after. I'm overdue. I'm overdue for a trip to the Big Smoke. I got to get down and see some folks and uh, spend a weekend sometime soon. But yes, uh, I think... I think we can put a, a button or a bow. We'll put a bow on this. We'll put a, a bow on this. A, 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 uh, who was it who always wore the bow tie? Not not Tucker Carlson, but was it uh, Ed? Uh, ben Stein. Ben Stein. Didn't he wear a bow tie at one time? Yes. Remember win yes. Ben Stein's money? He was an economist? Yes. Yeah. 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 A bow tie, a ben Stein bow tie on it. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Dave. One thing I'm going to do, uh, I, you know, I couldn't find my hat 
time to put it on for you. I figured that'd probably uh, be the that's... most Alberta thing I could do. But in fact, just cutting you off and letting you freeze in the dark would probably be. <laughs> <laughs> Hats are something else you have in common. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grizzly is definitely not adverse to a jauntily posed chapeau. I have multiple, <laughs> hats. multiple hats, sir. Yeah, no, I you got to win. Well, it's good, especially when you have this haircut, right? You got to. Otherwise, if you've never had skin flaking off your head from a sunburn, then you yeah. just don't yeah. know what it's you like. You learn that mistake once, and after that, it's like, nope, hat in nope. the summer, hat in the winter. You get two weeks in the spring and maybe two weeks in the autumn where you don't need it, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, Dave, it's back, Jack. Thank you so much for coming on our show, and thank you so much for like reaching out because. Uh, I'm forward-ish, but not as forward. I usually like hint and suggest and whatnot, and then some, and hope somebody picks up. And then eventually, if that doesn't happen, then it's like, would you like to come on the show? Uh, so that you proactively uh, reached out, uh, made my job way easier. <laughs> so I, yeah. I like people who make the first move. <laughs> I, uh, I've rarely been accused of being subtle. That's okay. That's okay. I'm fine with that. That's okay. We need we need we need a few. <laughs> it's time for people pleasure. of you know. It's time for people of good character to step up. Yeah. Well, Either run for saying. politics, get involved in politics, question politics. This isn't rocket surgery. You know, there's places you can sort out what's shit and what's shinola, mm -hmm. and um, that there's a number of us in Alberta who are working very hard to get messages out for Alberta's uh, particular issues, but Ontario's and Canada's issues need something similar. And, um, you know, I, I do appreciate and applaud you guys taking the time out of your, your lives, which is really what you're doing to volunteer, to be, you know, the sort of journalism, uh, the sort of information sharing. Thank you. We're not journalists. We don't know. I, 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 and I recognize the difference. I, yeah. I recognize the difference. Um, mm -hmm. I have, you know, three friends who are foreign war correspondents. I used to spend my Thursday afternoons at Beer Church, which was a gathering of reporters and press secretaries from the government. So, yeah, no, I, I but this sort of information sharing, this discussion, mm -hmm. I think and I hope will be useful to people to get them excited to go and do something, mm, right? right? Don't be, don't just sit back and let it happen to you. Don't let these yahoos who are saying stupid things do stupid things. Make noise. The one thing that I've learned about politics is that the only solvent is heat. Mm -hmm. So if you put heat on them, they dissolve. And um, that's what we're working on here. Absolutely. That's well said. Our, our, what's our motto, sir? Because democracy is something you do. That's the <laughs> motto of our show. Uh, oh. Kits and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the, I was going to say the Daily Beaver Morning Show, which technically it is, it, but the True North Eager Beaver Interview Project. We hope that you enjoyed listening to us because we we really enjoyed making this. This was you. a lot of fun. We hope that you will come back, please. Oh, yes. Okay. At your convenience. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, you're great. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. No, because a lot of these are complicated concepts. Because, and you have this skill that's called popularization that you're able to take something that's very complex and explain it, you know, to it's people that are be. not in that field. And it, it's a very hard thing to do. That was my specialization when I was in communications. And it's a very, it's, it's a very prized and valued skill, and it is hard to do. It's, um, it's something that we need to do more. I call it the, um, you know, we're we're in the art of numbers, uh, economists, accountants, and financial guys. Uh, we have these arcane concepts that are meaningless to most people unless you explain them. And so that's one thing I hope to do this year is to get out a little, you know, 100-page book on understanding the art of numerology as it affects our ordinary lives. You know, so people can understand that thing between why is the GDP up, but, you know, my bank account's empty, mm -hmm. right? Right. You know, the, a lot of things that get glossed over um, in simple numbers that people need to understand so they can know how to vote. Well, and, and 
you know, what you say is interesting because that's just what the Prime Minister said on Stephen Colbert's show the other night. Yes, the economy is doing good. Yes, the GDP is, is good. But the average Canadian is feeling it when they go to put gas in their car, they go to buy groceries, or they have to rent a new place. They're feeling it, and, and wages have been stagnant. So we need to work together. I was like, holy shit. This well, guy's, you know. Yeah, and the, you know, the solution actually isn't that complicated. Uh, it's to tax the rich just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. It's like a 1% tax on wealth would be enough to fund everything we need to fund. But to hear them say it, you would think you were extracting it from them by unanesthetized surgery, yeah. right? Um, the one they won't thing, even feel it. The, they wouldn't at all. Uh, but you would, you would swear that every dollar was being removed from their rectum. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's true. I've, I've had conversations with, with moneyed individuals who are all, oh, I'm voting for Polly F because he's going to, he's going to, I'm like, no, no, man. You're not that rich. <laughs> You've got money, but you're not rich enough that you're going to be benefit from what he does. You're going to feel the pinch. You know why? Because when he cuts social programs, it's going to cost us more in the long run. Yeah. A true progressive Cubs. conservative knows this. Remember, Kids and Cubs, if your current net worth is below $25 million, you probably have nothing to worry about. Yeah. And Just we should be friends. And we should be friends. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Working together, rowing in the same direction as the rest of the team. That's Thank right. Very much. Yes. Thank you. Um, so remember, Kiss and Cups, sharing is caring. Word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, well, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, because she sponsors our pod page. If you're listening, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and when you go there and click subscribe when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it comes directly to you you don't even have to go looking for it and trust me this is going to be one episode you're really 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 happy came to you news you can use here all right if you'd like to support us real pleasure (laughs) thank you it's been an absolute Um, pleasure sir if you'd like to support us in other ways kits and cubs you can make like kit elaine and Surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver YouTube page where we have buttons like share, subscribe. Please click them. It makes us happy and you earn our undying gratitude. And if you'd like to help us in another way, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you to our coffee page. So if you enjoyed this interview, you like what we do. Thank you so much. See, he knows it. We're going to have to give him royalties now. <laughs> if you don't click them, you won't lick them. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, if you like our product and you'd like to encourage us to do more, then uh, you will find our tip jar there. Coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And uh, if you donate, remember, tipping is super, super sexy. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Because democracy is something that you do. I cannot say it any better than our guest has said it. So uh, I will let that stand. Do something. Get involved. Something. Find a question that you wanted the answer to. Research it yourself. Bounce some ideas off some friends. Talk about it. Share this show with as many people as you can. You'll get some Join information it. you might not have heard before. Join a political party. Yeah. Yes. Yes, especially join a political party. I keep on telling them that's where the real action is at. If you want better candidates to vote for at the end, make sure that you take part of the triage at the nomination yeah. and party leadership level. And if you join the party, then you get to find out just how dumb they are in person. <laughs> yes, you do. Maybe choose better next time. <laughs> well, we keep saying it. Stop electing stupid people, please. Thank <laughs> you. For the future of the country and your children and grandchildren. Stop electing stupid people. Uh, and rich guys. Choose smarter wives. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Remember. It could be a tough world out there, kids and cubs, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom before we go? I don't, I don't know if I can add to this conversation with anything in addition other than, yeah, you just, please get out there. Share this with as many people as you can because the sad thing that we've seen in the last 15 years is the erosion of information readily available to people. And people are not, all they're getting is their, their sound bites on, on Twitter or Facebook, the 30 second clip, which has been edited to make a certain politician look a certain way. You're not getting the real true story. And because most of the media is owned by foreign corporations in this country, they're only going to paint the candidate they want 
to look good, good. So yeah, share this with as many people as you can and let and, people know there's information out there. And Dave, any words of wisdom? <sighs> Pick a non Ford government next time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. That'd be very wise. And as Mr. Grizzly says, you're right. That's one of the reasons why we do this interview uh, show in this format. Longer times get to get into subjects, politics and full sentences. No quick sound bites. Nope. No, you get to hear what people are thinking, how they get from A to B to C, because this is the information that you need to know. All right. Perfect. Everyone have a beaver perfect day, everyone. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. Where did I put it? Oh, there it is. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>